So thank you everybody for coming along tonight and welcome to the first ever speed mooting champion of champions moot. Uh, tonight's event is an exhibition moot and a Q&A session. So I'd like to say thank you to you all uh, for coming along tonight. I'll start with just some sort of housekeeping rules for tonight. Uh, you'll notice that you're all on mute. Uh, I'd like to keep you all on mute for as long as possible and only come off mute if you happen to speak at any point during the evening. Uh, tonight's session is being recorded for our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to switch off your video camera so that you don't appear in the recording, that is absolutely fine. The programme tonight is as follows. We will start with the moot first. So we have Aria Tabrizi, who was our 2019 speed mooting champion, taking on Robert Allen, who was the 2020 speed mooting champion. We have three judges for our moot tonight, who are Darren Weir, Callum Brook and Gerard Rogerson. After that, we will then proceed on to a Q&A session with practitioners. And then following on from the Q&A session, we will then have the judgments from tonight's moot and some feedback from the judges. I just have a few more people joining the meeting now, who I, I will admit. Um, just to give you some background on the speed moot. So the national speed mooting competition takes place once a year. And it's a competition for law undergraduates and GDL students across the nation to take part in. Uh, it's quite a unique competition in that students receive the brief and the MOOC problem the night before the competition. And the idea behind that is to replicate the situation in practice whereby a solicitor or a barrister receives a late brief, they have bit, very little time to prepare and then have to go into court the next day and present the case. All of the case law and all of the legislation is provided. The skeleton arguments are pre-drafted, so uh, students are only being tested on their oral advocacy. And we have up to 128 people that take part in a single day competition, and it works its way all the way down until we have a single uh, participant left who is the winner. So we have the previous two winners who are competing against each other tonight. So in just a moment, I will hand over to our mooters uh, to proceed. So the running order for tonight is that Robert will be representing the appellant and Aria will be representing the respondent. Now, normally with it being speed mooting, we would have seven minutes of submissions per mooter with a single question by way of judicial intervention. Tonight, to make it slightly different, I'm allowing up to 12 minutes of submissions per participant and I'm allowing up to three questions. So you can see a little bit more in terms of how they develop their advocacy and also a little bit more by way of judicial intervention. Once the moot is over, the, um, the judges will go off into a breakout room, and at that point we'll go into the Q&A session. Uh, Robert will also be giving a brief summary of the facts, just so you understand what the moot is about. So in a moment, I'll hand over, and Robert, are you ready to proceed? I am, yes, and thank you very much, first of all, John, for everything this evening and making it possible. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay. All Thanks. right. Uh, when you're ready, Robert, um, in your own time. Thank you, my lords, and may it please the court. I, Mr. Allen, am representing the Appellant Crown Prosecution Service in this case. My learned friend, Mr. Tabrizi, represents the, the respondent, Mr. Shafiq. The basis of this appeal is that the decision of the High Court, given on 25th October 2019, be overturned and Mr Shafiq's conviction be reinstated. Would my Lords care for a summary of the facts? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> the Anytown Drifting Club, the ADC, is a members only club. Members bring their cars to drift on a racetrack. To become a member, one must own a Japanese or German car, that car having at least 300 brake horsepower, and the individual must pay an annual 300 pound fee. Evidence of one's ability to comply must also be sent to the club manager prior to joining. The car park for the ADC is situated on any town high street. There is one point of entry and exit, generally guarded by a barrier activated by a pressure pad. There are 35 spaces in that car park and it can generally only be used by members. In its tenure history, 
there have been no reports of non-members using that car park. On the night of 9th of March 2019, a Mr. Clinton Shafiq, a member, attended the ADC's 10th annual dinner in the clubhouse, parking his car in the car park. That night, members were entitled to bring with them a guest, each paying £30 a ticket. In total, there were 50 members alongside 50 guests in attendance. Those members were also entitled, as a one-off, to use the car park at a £1 fee. The barrier remained up all evening and 30 cars were parked. At 10pm, a police constable spotted Mr Shafiq getting into his car whilst attempting to move it to an alternative space in the car park. The constable suspected, correctly, that Mr Shafiq was intoxicated over and above the legal limit. Mr Shafiq was consequently arrested pursuant to Section 51A, the Road Traffic Act 1988. At first hearing, Mr Shafiq pleaded not guilty. He did accept that he was over the prescribed limit, but claimed that the car park was a private place and therefore fell outside the scope of 51A. Having been convicted by a district judge at trial, Mr Shafiq's conviction was later quashed by the High Court following his successful appeal. The Crown is now appealing this case to the Supreme Court on a point of law of general public importance, the sole issue in dispute being this, whether the ADC car park is to be regarded as a public or private place for the purposes of the Road Traffic Act. And those, my lords, are the facts. My lords, uh, I wish to start by spending a short time establishing with some greater precision uh, the question that I submit this court must answer prior to addressing my main submissions. Uh, for conviction, my Lord, Section 51A of the Road Traffic Act uh, requires that Mr Shafiq be driving in a public place. But what constitutes a public place? If I may turn your Lordship's attention to the case of DPP and Vivier, uh, 1991 RTR 205, uh, which my lords will find at page 20 of the electronic bundle. And at this time, uh, my lords, may I request to dispense with formal citations? Yes, that's fine. I'm grateful, thank you, my lord. Um, Vive adopted a, a Euston generous approach to define public place as a place to which the public has access. Guidance on the term access hails from Pew and Knight. At the middle of page 42 of your Lordship's e-bundle, uh, Lord Widgery states that the best way of showing access is to show that the public actually go there. This approach was further adopted in The Queen Against Spence. Uh, Lord Justice Henry at page 52 uh, put it quite succinctly, that this was a question not whether the public could uh, have had access, but whether the public utilised that access. Uh, and my lords, I therefore submit that the question uh, for the court is this, uh, was the ADC car park a place that the public utilised? Uh, in my response, this appeal will show beyond reasonable doubt, as required by Pew and Knight, that the question may be answered in the affirmative on the facts. My Lords, I wish to present this appeal on two grounds. At first, that even as a member of the ADC, Mr Shafiq was a public person in a public place. Second, that Parliament could not have intended Section 51A not to apply in circumstances such as those before us. If I may then, my Lords, uh, turn to my first ground, that Mr Shafiq's membership that did not preclude the car park from being a public place. Uh, and if I may direct your Lordship's attention to pages 26 to 28 of the e-bundle, uh, DPP and Vivier once again, um, Mr Justice Brown turns to examine Harrison and Hill uh, at page 26, stating that private places are those occupied by a special class of members of the public. At page 28, 
Mr. Justice Brown sought to define special class persons uh, as those who have gone through a screening process on account of some characteristic personal to themselves. Uh, this case distinguishes those individuals from the public at large who may indeed be admitted, but only on the basis that they are willing to make some payment uh, and meet whatever other conditions the landowner wishes to impose. Uh, I contend, my lords, that the facts of Vivia are not wholly dissimilar uh, to the facts before us. Uh, that case concerned a caravan park, but those staying on the site had to register, they had to make payment and comply with various requirements. Uh, it was held that the mere premise uh, that the caravan owners were prepared to satisfy conditions uh, that did not uh, constitute their presence in a special uh, class. The site was therefore held to be public. Uh, on our facts, my lords, there are four requirements for the aspiring member of the ADC. First, they own a Japanese or German car. Second, that the car has a minimum 300 brake horsepower. And third, that they send evidence of the above uh, by email. Uh, fourth, they must also make payment of £300 annually. Uh, we've already established from Vivier that payment on its own does not make one special. Indeed, anyone in the public, uh, my lords, can be willing to pay. But what for the other requirements? Do they place Mr Shafiq into a special class? Uh, this, my lords, is where our facts I submit are analogous with those in Vivier. Ownership of a caravan there was said simply to be showing a mere fondness for the activity in question. Likewise, I submit uh, that whilst owning a German or Japanese car with 300 brake horsepower uh, does indeed show some enthusiasm for driving pursuits, uh, mm -hmm. does show a fondness arguably for the activity, such cars are in fact relatively commonplace on our roads. So to stop you, Mr. Allen, if I may. Um, yes, madam. In, if you could help me with this, you essentially say that that Vivier is very similar to the facts of this case. The whole yes. point about the caravan park, though, was that when people go to the caravan park, they are members of the public, and then when they satisfy the conditions by way of a booking and pay, they then become um you know people who are going to the, the caravan park and part of a class whereas this case is slightly different isn't it because they in order for them to go to the club they actually have had to join as members so it's very different isn't it to the case of Vivian? Uh, my lord i'm grateful if i could respond in this way um, the reason that i submit the two cases are similar is on the grounds that um mr shafiq was a member of the public, and in joining at the ADC, he temporarily, and of course all memberships are temporary, he temporarily was admitted and able to enjoy the benefits of the club. And indeed the same for the caravan visitors, that they temporarily are afforded the enjoyment of the land. But I submit that those two temporary bases, one may indeed be considerably longer than the other, are both too modest to define those individuals as part of a special class. Um, my Lords, I would like to um, just summarise that, uh, if I may, by saying that Mr Shafiq um, was indeed an owner of one of these cars, but the cars were commonplace on the roads, um, that indeed there's nothing exclusive about them um, beyond the virtue of their price. And I therefore submit, um, as I answered to uh, your Lordship's question, um, that the ownership of that car is too modest a condition to render Mr Shafiq as part of a special class, and that that being so, um, the ADC was a public place. Uh, I would further submit, my Lords, that the requirement to send proof of car ownership by email uh, is not a scrupulous way of assessing um, the candidate uh, for ADC membership. Vivia raised Panama and Newbury at page 28 of the e-bundle. Uh, in Panama, club membership was held not to constitute preclusion of public entertainment, 
uh, on the grounds that there was no form of rigorous selection process. On our facts, my lords, anyone could send an email to the club manager claiming to satisfy the criteria. Uh, where other clubs may indeed require members are nominated, proposed, seconded, interviews conducted, the check and balance here by ADC is nothing more than a formality, I submit. Um, and I submit to your lords that uh, if a special class could be formed by such lapsadaisical means as these, a great many of us would find ourselves it rather easy to be considered a special class. My lords, with your permission, I now wish to move to the second. Um, Alan, before you, before you oh, do, yes. just one more point on that. So if you, was, if, if you had, for example, the local Labour Club or the local Conservative Club, by your definition, they would never become private places, they'd always be public then, is that right? Uh, my Lords, it is, um, and this is not refusing to answer that question, but it is for your Lordships to devise that test. My own um, interpretation um, of the law as it stands is that it is valuable to have some form of qualifying factor, be that in some form of expertise or skill, but that mere ownership of something uh, is not enough. Um, so, uh, both on the rigour aspect of joining and on the aspect of possessing the criteria to become part of a special class, there must be some measurable means beyond ownership and sending of an email uh, in order to be able to define someone in those terms that were put uh, by his lordship. Uh, if I may, with permission, uh, my lords, move on to the second round of appeal. Uh, there has been much discussion in previous case law throughout the e-bundle uh, on the purpose of Section 51A, the Road Traffic Act itself. Uh, if your Lordships wish to turn by way of example to page 43 of the e-bundle, uh, my Lords, Lord Justice Watkins utilised uh, the mischief rule uh, in application to the multi-storey car park case uh, of Bowman and DPP. His Lordship posed that uh, Section 51A exists in its essence uh, to protect people from injury uh, and property from damage. But that said, his Lordship felt reluctantly unable in the circumstances to interpret the statute broadly to define that car park as public. Why? At first, I submit, uh, because the case was heard in the High Court. Your Lordships need no reminding that this is the first time this matter has been brought before the Supreme Court. And this, of course, grants the opportunity to draw a clear line under the stream of conflicting Court of Appeal and High Court decisions and clarify the law with policy in mind. Your Lordships are not bound, as at paragraph 35 of page 60, uh, Mr Justice Mitting expressed in DPP and Cowan, to apply highly undesirable law. Uh, second, uh, I submit Bowman was not interpreted broadly because the multi-storey car park was near empty. It was held that the potential risk, risk was low. Um, contrast that, my lords, with our present case. A small car park with 30 cars contained. Inside the clubhouse, 100 party goers, drinking, celebrating dinner. Uh, I submit, my lords, that in their jovial spirit, it is not unreasonable by any means to imagine those persons spilling out having finished their dinner and coming under grave threat from Mr Shafiq's drunk driving. Mr Allen, if I may. Yes. Thank that, you, is, that is a hypothetical, isn't it? You have no evidence before the court that the public were indeed using that car park, do you? Uh, that is, I, I, I'm grateful, my lord, and that is the case in these circumstances. Um, but my, so my second submission um, to your lordships uh, is that it is highly fortunate, highly fortunate, that in this case nobody was hurt, that no property damage was done, and that on policy grounds, given the extensive discussion in previous case law, when the Court of Appeal has been unable um, to find a route forwards, that this evening presents an opportunity for your Lordships to um, apply policy and consider what the circumstances could have been in other, in other events. Um, my Lords, given the circumstances in contention this evening, uh, that the ADC membership requirements were modest to say the very best, uh, and that Parliament surely cannot have intended Section 51A to allow individuals to drive drunk in a busy car park in close proximity 
uh, to higher numbers of people. I plea, my lords, that you will find satisfied the answer to the question that I first posed, that the ADC car park was a place that the public utilised, uh, and thus my lords will grant this appeal. This marks the end of my submissions, unless I can assist your lordships any further. Thank you. Mr. Allen, could I just raise this, uh, please? Um, would it not be undesirable from the point of view of public protection to turn every private car park into a public place? And um, as um, has already been put to you, and particularly with reference to the case of, of Pew and Knipe, um, is it not the case that there is no evidence here that any member of the public not only used this car park on the evening, but indeed had used it for the past 10 years. Uh, and in addition, that surely this was a private car park because the only people entitled to be present that night were there by specific invitation. So what would you say to that point, Mr. Allen? My Lord, I'm extremely grateful. Um, if I may answer it like this, the second submission on policy grounds um, I wish to be very much um, tempered by my first submission on the grounds that the membership criteria in this particular case uh, was not satisfactory to define the club as being a private place. Now, there may be other circumstances, um, as uh, your Lordship raises, where it is a wholly private environment, the car park is private, and therefore the law of Section 518 would not apply. Um, but that first submission um, is to argue that in these particular circumstances, that criteria has not been met. The conditions are too modest. Uh, with um, respect to your Lordship's second point, um, this is why my submissions have not focused with any great regard to the visitor aspect, uh, because indeed the visitors, um, it is, and I'm sure my learned friend may address this, uh, can be argued to be there as an attachment of those members. So it's my primary submission, uh, Your Lordship, that the members themselves were not private by warrant of the fact that the conditions that they um, were required to meet were far too modest to deem them un in those terms. So Mr Allen, do you concede then that if we are not with you on your first submission, that it, you have no evidence that the car park has been used by the public? Uh, my Lord, it, is, it would be a far weaker submission to argue on the basis of visitors. I have spent uh, my time this evening um, on the primary um, argument, the first submission, um, being that the membership uh, criteria are too modest. Um, I submit that that is a, a strong basis um, to define this car park as being public um, because of the case law that currently exists um, because of the facts that are so similar. So it is less of a focus, your, your, right in, your Lordship is right in saying that, that the visitors were there, but more so that the members themselves, uh, and I, I submit confidently that the members themselves um, were uh, indeed not meeting conditions that were, were rigorous enough um, to define uh, as private. I have nothing further. I don't know if my fellow judges do. No, thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank, thank you. you. I'm extremely grateful. Mr. Tabrizi. I'm grateful. If it pleases the court, uh, my name is Aria Tabrizi. I act, as has been mentioned, as, as counsel for the respondent in this matter. Uh, my lords, I, I'm grateful for my learned opponent's summary of the facts, and, and, and we adopt those, unless otherwise stated. Um, the court is, of course, well aware at this point what the salient issue is before it, and I don't intend to labour uh, on that, but clearly, um, the salient issue in this matter is whether the car park of the ADC was a public place for the purpose of Section 5 events. Um, we say, of course, that it wasn't, and, and we have three submissions to make in support of that. Uh, can I just check with the court that uh, your lordships have had sight of our skeleton argument at pages 16 and 17? 
yes, grateful. We I'm grateful, my lord. Um, I, I first plan to deal with the burden on the crown and whether they've discharged that burden in evidencing that the car park was used by the public in general. I then plan to deal with the two classes of people that were present at the car park on the night in question. We say there were two, and I believe that's uncontroversial, members and guests. Um, if I can assist the court no further on any preliminary matter, I plan to move on to my first submission, which is general public use. Um, our first submission is that because the car park of the ADC is prima facie a private land, the Crown must establish, it is necessary for the Crown to establish that the land is used by the general public if it is to satisfy the meaning of a public place for our purposes. We say that they have failed to do this and we go further and we say that not only have they failed to do this but actually the facts before the court are a stark example of a place which is ostensibly not a public place and um, the case we rely on which is our most important uh, precedent we we say that this case is on all fours on all material fours with with that of pew and knight um, if i can take the court to it, the case begins at page 45 but i plan to take your lordships to specific parts of the judgment starting at page 49 uh, and it's the divisional court led by, as he was then, Lord Chief Justice Widgery. So not binding, but of course of, of some, some, some persuasion uh, to even this court. And at page 49, um, it's the first paragraph, second sentence. The manager, however, did not speak, and this is very important, to any actual specified use of the car park by persons other than members or their guests. Well, in Pew and Knight, the court held that on facts very similar to this, a car park of a members club was not a public place. And they relied in doing so on the fact that there was no evidence before the court at first instance that the mem that members of the general public used that car park. And we say that the court is obliged to find the same here. And if I can take just for completeness the court down to page 50. Again, it's the judgment, uh, the single unanimous judgment of Lord Chief Justice Widgery. And it's the first paragraph halfway down. And I don't intend to read the entire passage to the court, but it starts off according, accordingly in order to turn what on the face of it is a piece of private land, namely the private car park, into a public place, it is necessary in my judgment to show that the public have access to it. And his Lordship goes on to say that perhaps the only way of establishing that is, just, is to show that the public did in fact use it. Mr. Tabrizi, um, perhaps the, the preliminary issue should be for you to deal with Mr. Allen's submission that actually it never was private in the first place. You're, you're going on the basis that it's accepted that it's private land, but We've heard from Mr. Allen that the Crown don't accept that mere membership of this club means that the space is private. In fact, he starts from the premise that actually it's public and always is public. What do you say to that? I'm, I'm grateful, my Lord. And I will, I will indeed deal with um, my learned opponent's submissions in regards to the, the class of person, being, the, the, the membership being a, a, a public class of person, we say that it isn't. And um, when I speak of the land being prima facie private, what we say by that is that clearly this is not a public highway. It is a privately owned piece of land. And in order to show that a privately owned piece of land is a public place for the purposes of this act, one has to show that the public have access to it. And we say the Crown have not evidenced that. In fact, the, on the facts before the court, the, the, the material facts before the court today are what? That members and guests only were invited on the night in question and that there had been no use of the car park by the public for 10 years. That's insufficient to satisfy the burden incumbent upon them to show that it is 
a public place and the burden is theirs to prove and they have not done so. Um, if I can address your Lordship's, um, your Lordship's question more specifically in regards to membership. Um, if I can draw the court's attention to the Crown and Spence, um, it's page 54 in particular of the bundle. Uh, the Crown and Spence was uh, a court of appeal case. It, it concerned dangerous driving in a car park attached to an office building. And the Court of Appeal considered what constituted a special class of person so as to be distinct from general members of the public. And at page 54, paragraph 7, Lord Justice Henry stated, the evidence in this clay case is that it was employees, customers, and business visitors who used the car park led us to the conclu conclusion that those categories of people were of a special class those with business there. Now turning to our facts, our lords, um, what class of person, what, what requirements does an individual have to satisfy to become the class of person known as a member? Well, you've heard from my learned opponent that it's mere ownership of a car. And um, that's simply not the case. It's 300 pounds in annual fees, which is not an insignificant amount, but we would perhaps concede not sufficient in and of itself to distinguish members from, from uh, the general public at large. But it's then ownership of not just the car, and we would say that that at this point is becoming sufficient, but it's ownership of a German or Japanese car with a certain specification. It's proving that you meet those requirements in advance of signing up for a membership, a continual membership, an indefinite annual membership. It is not, like in the case of Bivier, cited before the court previously, merely turning up and paying an entrance fee at any point in time that you may choose. And that, we say, is important. That takes members of the ADC from individuals of members of the public at large utilizing a, a place or a service at a cost to members of a private class. Um, can I assist the court any further on that? I, I, I apologize for interrupting you, but um, you've just detailed the preliminary requirements to become a member of this uh, drifting club. But looking at the matter pragmatically in terms of what a member of the public might find on the night, wasn't it the case that the, the barrier to this car park was raised? And this is a car park situated just off the high street of any town. So is there not therefore a, a, an implied right for the public to access that car park? I'm grateful, my Lord. And um, we take your point. We, we certainly can see that that's perhaps the strongest line of argument against um, the respondent. But what we say to that is that the barrier which usually demarcates the car park from the public highway being up is not sufficient to tr transform that place from one which the public, public do not have access to into one into which the public do have access to. And, it, and, and in support of that, because it is a very valid point your Lordship raises, if I can take you to page 48 of the bundle, and again it's Pew and Knight, and it's worth reminding the court at this point that in Pew and Knight, there were no barriers, there, were, there was no signage, and there was no demarcation between the car park of the country club and the, the roadway which allowed access to it. But if I can take you to page 48, and it's, it's the fourth paragraph down, or three quarters into that paragraph, and it's, this, it's the segment that begins, I interpret that to mean, and his lordship has just explained um, that the club allow vehicles up to the front entrance of the club through the car park. Um, they allow it, they permit it, one might say they encourage it, in order to drop and pick members up. And he, he says, his lordship says of this, I interpret that to mean, and have consistently interpreted it to mean, that if a vehicle seeks to approach the front entrance of the club, in order to pick up or set down passengers, 
such a vehicle is allowed to do so. Indeed, it is a fairly obvious conclusion. I do not read that finding as meaning that the public at large, in any sense, are given access to the area in front of the door of the club. We would say a mere raising of the barrier that usually prevents access falls in line with the reasoning of his lordship there in Pew and Knight. It's not sufficient to transform what is a private area into a public one, especially when the Crown haven't evidenced any use of such by the public on the night in question. Um, your lord, my lord, can I assist you any further on that point? No, thank you, Mr. Tabrizi. Mr. Tabrizi, I quickly have a point in, in relation to that. If I can take you to page 50 of Lord uh, Widgery's comments, because um, he was very much troubled with this case, wasn't he? He actually believed that it could have been found that uh, this was a public place if the magistrate had drawed, drawn um, specific inferences from the evidence. So the case doesn't give you authority, does it, to simply say, well, because you can't just simply, if there's a barrier there, that's not enough to make it a, a public place if it's raised. Because it said, he, said, uh, he said this, um, I feel looking at this as an observer, that the probability may well be that they did use it, otherwise the public did probably use that car park. And if we look at the map in this case, and what um, my uh, fellow Lord, Lord uh, Rogerson said that uh, it's very close to the road, you could draw an inference, couldn't you, that the public probably do use this car park. And in those circumstances, there would be evidence to infer that it is used by the public. And if the court below, if the magistrates had originally come to that conclusion, then as Lord Widgery had sa says, if the um, magistrate had come to that conclusion, um, he, I, that would have been the end of it. So this authority doesn't give us authority to basically say that, well, if the public could access it, that's not enough. It actually says that you could actually infer from that that they do in fact access it. Do you see my point? I, I take your Lordship's point, uh, and you, your Lordship is quite correct. One could draw at tr uh, a fact-finding trial, one could, upon presentation of all the available evidence, draw such an inference if it was so appropriate. Um, we say that's not the case here. It, it, it is worth reminding, though, of course, I, 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 there is no need, uh, the court, that the burden is on the Crown in this particular matter. Um, they have not been able to establish or persuade the lower courts to draw such an inference. It, 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 we, we, we would say it would be inappropriate for this court to draw an inference of that at this stage. Um, and, and all we say is we don't rely on that passage of Pew and Knight to say that um, there is always, um, that, or that it is always going to be insufficient. It's not always insufficient to show that merely because the public have access to it. Um, that's insufficient to show that it, it, it isn't a public place. At times it might well be, um, but it is fact dependent. Um, and again, on, 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 in, in this particular case, that has not been, that has not been evidenced. Um, and we won't, I won't draw, I won't draw into um, issues of whether it should have been, but of course it hasn't been. And so therefore we say that your hands, with respect, this court's hands are tied in that sense. Um, my Lord, if I can assist you no further on that point, um, I am wary of time. Um, I had anticipated dealing with the, the, the visitors on the line as a separate class of person. Um, if the court could perhaps indicate to me whether they'd still like me to address them briefly on that, I'm aware that my learned opponent didn't feel fit uh, to, to make any positive argument as such. Mr. Tabrizi, I was going to ask you specifically, and your learned friend may have made a, a somewhat jovial and flippant comment about the readily, ava readily availability of high-powered German or Japanese motor cars in today's society, and it may well be that we agree or disagree with him on that particular point. However, uh, the difficulty as I see it is this, that whilst 
you may scrape over the line in respect of the ordinary members of the club having a particular condition that they have to settle. The guests of those members did not, did they? They merely had to drive in, pay a fee, and they could enter the premises. I, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful, uh, my lord. I, I will address um, your question briefly, um, if, if time allows. In, in, and in, in doing so, we say this. Um, there is one very clearly discernible quality to guests of members that night. And we say that it is they were invited by members of the club. These individuals share a quality that they were invited by members of the club upon the club's permission to attend the premises that evening. And they entered the premises in order to attend that specific one-off event to which they were invited. And we say that this does not, that it means they are incapable of being considered members of the public at large. Because when one looks at the case law, and I don't know if I have time to take the court there now, but the case that was cited in our skeleton argument is Cowan and DPP, and it's page 58 of the bundle for completeness. But when one looks at the case law, there is an either or test, either the, the class of person has to have a special characteristic or condition, or they have to be in attendance for a specific purpose personal to themselves or the occupier. And we say that the visitors or the guests on that night satisfy that second alternative of the test. They were there for a very specific purpose, personal to themselves, personal to the members. And for that reason, to call them members of the public at large, would be incorrect, be plainly incorrect in our submissions. And um, for, for that reason, and that reason alone, my Lord, um, can I assist you any further on that point? No, thank you, Mr. Squeezy. I, I'm grateful. Um, in, in conclusion, my Lords, uh, to allow this appeal would serve injustice in the present matter. Perhaps more importantly, it would undermine a lengthy history of case law and conduct which Parliament has had ample opportunity to alter if it so wished. We say that the case law is clear that situations, factual matrices such as this, do not lend themselves to being uh, a public place. Parliament has had plenty of opportunity in the various uh, reenactments of the Road Traffic Act to amend that or to make it clearer. They have failed to do so. Uh, for that reason, we say it would be inappropriate for you, this court, as implored, as implored by my learned friend, to, to uh, act in, a, in its limited policy capacity and, and alter the state of the common law um, and the definition of, of what constitutes a public place for the purposes of, of a Section 5 offence. Um, for those reasons um, and those previously expounded, we in, invite the court to dismiss the appeal. And if I can be of no further assistance, that concludes my submissions. Thank you, Mr. Tabrizi. My Lords, is there anything that you would seek to ask? I'm grateful. That gentleman will rise. Thank you very much to both of you. That was an enjoyable moot and very high quality advocacy. And uh, thank you to the judges. I think you gave uh, both mooters a very hard time there. Um, so I'm sure they enjoyed that. Um, so what we're going to do now is we'll move on to the second part of the evening, which is the Q&A session. Uh, in just a moment, after I've asked the first question as well, I will um, put the three judges into a breakout room so that they can deliberate and come back with judgment later. Uh, so to start, what I will do is I will introduce each of our panellists for tonight. Um, so first we have John Dilworth, who is a former Chief Crown Prosecutor. So John, if you'd like to come on and just say a few words about uh, your background. Okay, yeah. I think you've just promoted me there. I, I actually retired as Deputy Chief Crown Prosecutor uh, in Mercy Cheshire two years ago. I had previously acted as Chief Crown Prosecutor, but didn't secure the final spot, so to speak. Uh, during my uh, time in the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, I prosecuted in both the Crown Court and the Magistrates Court. And I was also responsible for teaching on the Crown Prosecution Service High Court Advocacy course 
and was also responsible in part for devising <coughs> the case materials for that course. Um, that's me in a nutshell. Uh, I'm a barrister by calling um, and uh, I don't want to take any further time of telling you my life story. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Alice Kuzmenko, who is a pupil at Number One Crown Office Row. Hello everyone. I am indeed a pupil, but as of next week I will be a tenant practicing at One Crown Office Row. We deal mostly with clinical negligence and public law, but at the junior end we do a lot of personal injury, employment law, immigration law, so quite a lot of uh, civil stuff. That's me for now. Thank you. Uh, next we have Carl Wolf, who is a solicitor advocate at Noble Solicitors. Yes, good evening everyone. Um, uh, I am uh, 25 years qualified. Um, I primarily these days deal with criminal defence. Uh, my practice is almost predominantly now Crown Court trials. Uh, and although I still spend time in the middle of the night going to the police station uh, and occasionally on a Saturday court duties, primarily I'm a Crown Court trial advocate. Thank you. We have Sushil Kumar, who is a barrister at 25 Bedford Row. Um, hello everyone and congratulations Alice. Um, I specialise in criminal defence exclusively at 25 Bedford Row. Um, my primary practice areas are fraud um, and general crime which includes motoring and um, in my spare time or increasingly now I sit as a um, judge in the first tier tribunal. Excellent and finally we have Kadim Al Hassan who is a barrister at Park Square Chambers. Uh, good evening everybody. I'm, a, I'm cr mainly a criminal barrister. I've been practicing for about 27 years. I practice here in the UK and also in the Caribbean. So I uh, do a lot of varied uh, criminal work uh, up and down the country. Excellent. Thank you. So the way we'll work it tonight is we have some pre-prepared questions that some of you have sent in. So we'll start for about 15 minutes or so with some of those pre-prepared questions. And then in the second part of our Q&A session, if anyone uh, thinks of a question, you can pop your hand up and we'll bring you off onto the chat and you can ask the question or you can pop it into the written chat and we can ask the question to our panellists when we get to that point. Um, so the first question is quite an interesting one and one that a few of our panellists can comment on from uh, different points of view. So the first question is, how does practice as a self-employed barrister differ from that of an employed barrister or a solicitor advocate. Uh, so Sushil, would you like to start with this one? Um, yeah, of course, John. Uh, it's incredibly different and particularly so now. Um, the primary differences are that as a self-employed barrister, you're very much in control of your own destiny as to what areas of, in, uh, of work you choose to pursue, how much work you choose to pursue and also how you want to run your practice. There's no one to answer to other than yourself and on occasion um, your senior clerk and uh, <laughs> instructing solicitors. Uh, but it, it gives you a large degree of freedom to pursue other areas of law that you may be interested in that your employers uh, may not be too keen on you pursuing and also um, it allows you to follow other interests. Um, the issue now is obviously the availability of work to be undertaken in the criminal sphere, which is something that is keeping a lot of us out of court at the moment, and mostly on papers. Um, and obviously, uh, as a corollary to that, um, your eye is always on um, your next brief because there is no salary and there is no pension and there isn't really a great degree of job security in the future um, outside of the fact that you've got to make your name um, in your particular field of expertise and also be someone whom solicitors want to instruct on brief. So there's a larger degree of job uncertainty but you do get the benefit of being able to control your own destiny. So I'd say those there's large differences between the two. Thank you. Uh, next can we hear from um, Carl Wolf uh, on his perspective as a solicitor advocate? Uh, well, as an employed solicitor advocate, um, the obvious benefit, uh, which has become even uh, more starkly convenient uh, over the last few months, 
uh, is the fact that I am on a salary, uh, although I wasn't furloughed, uh, thankfully, um, even if I had have been, I would still have been getting 80% of my salary. Uh, but I've worked throughout lockdown um, and I've worked at exactly the same salary. Um, the benefits of being employed, of course, uh, as Sushil said, um, uh, there is a pension uh, which I'm entitled to. Uh, I have paid holidays, so if I uh, want to take time off, I don't have to worry how my bills are going to be paid. If I'm unwell, I get sickness pay. Uh, and for me, that's, that is the, the, the biggest benefit, is the security of income. Um, but also, uh, and I know this is a controversial point between solicitor advocates and barristers, being in-house, uh, and again, I think if you're in-house as a barrister, it's the same. But if you're in-house, the firm will often choose to keep the work in. And so I do get um, a very high variety um, of different cases. My practice area is predominantly serious fraud, serious violence, murder, um, and the like. Um, cases that perhaps I wouldn't ordinarily get uh, a first pick of if I was um, in chambers. Um, so in that respect, uh, I, I think my practice uh, has grown quite dramatically. My firm is very different. They give me the freedom uh, to go out and bring in any areas of work that I want to. Um, as long as it's profitable, um, it doesn't have to be legal aid work, it can be private. Uh, so those are the benefits from my point of view. Thank you. And just finally, can we hear from John Delworth on this point? Yeah, <clears throat> if I could deal with two points, one a positive, one a negative. A negative, certainly if you are employed by the Crown Prosecution Service, which is my background, is that you are only going to prosecute, you won't be defending. So to a large extent, 50% of the intellectual rigour of being an advocate is denied to you. Uh, on the positive side is the fact that um, the Crown Prosecution Service, in effect, is the biggest chambers in the country. And if a chambers has mutual support from members who can discuss cases and chew them over, uh, you've got a huge networking uh, facility available to you in the Crown Prosecution Service. And in fact, the policy department in the Crown Prosecution Service will deal with different aspects of the law. And of course, they will act as a clearing couch for any cases that are going to the appellate courts. So they will have their finger on the pulse because the reality is in every criminal case, the Crown Prosecution Service is involved uh, in, in them. So one positive, one negative from me. Fantastic. All right, we'll jump on to the next question now. Uh, the next question that we have is, do you have any practical tips on how you can improve your advocacy? Alice, would you like to start with this one? Sure. Um, I'd say the best tip I ever got in terms of structuring oral arguments was given to me by the Lord Chief Justice. So he you know, probably has, does know what he's talking about. And he said the best way to sort of approach it is think of preparing the judge's judgment for him. If you approach it as the sort of judgment you'd want to be reading that sort of layout, if you can present your oral arguments in that format, then you've more or less written the judgment for the judge. And that also means that you tend to have a really good flow, your points tend to link up well, and if you have good structure, then it's actually a lot easier to understand what the arguments even are. So if you can approach it in that way, I'd say that might be the best one. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Social, do you have any anything to add to that? Um, who am I to disagree with the Lord Chief? Um, but no, not a great deal to add, really. Just I think the most important thing about advocacy is uh, structure. So always keep a structure in mind and it prevents repetition and waffling. And I think just as a, a practical tip, harder to do now, but still in some circumstances possible, is to watch advocates in action and um, particularly those who have been around um, senior courts for, for a long time and you can see immediately what works and what doesn't and that prevents you from making your own mistakes which is important for you to do 
it also gives you a head start in working out what the best way to advance your arguments are. And I can say I learn every day when I'm led, when I go into court and when I see my opponents. So um, you're on a constant journey. Excellent. Uh, next, we have a very specific question. And I don't think there's anyone who can answer this question specifically on the panel, but I know that Alice has uh, done some research into this one for us. Um, so, do you have any tips for aspiring sports lawyers? I do indeed. We have quite a few uh, barristers at our chambers that do sports law. And so these tips come from somebody that does actually do sports law, unlike me. And there's three key things they suggested. Number one, read all the relevant sort of blogs on it. There's quite a few that do uh, free articles even. Um, they'll give you the, you know, the, uh, what's going on in that area of law. So that's a good info source. In terms of work experience, um, there's some law firms that will have sports departments so you can try and do something with them or even try and go the, uh, approach the, for instance, the regulatory bodies. So the Football Association, um, the Rugby Football Union as well. So that's another way in as sort of the in-house side. And the last thing, uh, the last tip given was consider what you would do on the other side. Because especially, I think, from the barrister side, you tend to do a lot more than just sports. That'll be an aspect of your practice, but it probably won't be your sole area of practice. So consider, will you do other regulatory work in other sort of fields? Will you do the sort of commercial side, maybe IP and image rights, um, maybe sort of anti-doping? So have a good idea of other things you can do that would complement, and that might also help you get into it as well. Excellent. Thank you. The next question that we have is how can I make myself the most employable candidate? Do we have anybody that would like to uh, jump in and offer an answer on this one? John? <clears throat> I think really it's about ensuring that when you are applying for a position, you ensure that you look at the um, competences that uh, the employer is looking for and they get yourself the most experienced to be able to demonstrate that you've got those competences so for example if you want to be a crown prosecutor you might want to look at the competency framework in relation to that particular job and then say to yourself well how am i going to be able to um, persuade the employer that I've got those competences. So look at where you want to be. Don't completely sort of box yourself into one position, but look at where you want to be and then think, how am I going to um, develop the building blocks to get where I need to be? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, do we have anybody else that would like to offer any insight on this question? Uh, I think um, from a solicitor's point of view, um, the people that come to us looking for employment, the ones that stand out are not necessarily the ones with the biggest grades um, or the best university. They're the ones who are prepared because they know about the firm. Uh, they've been um, spending time researching into the sort of work that we do, uh, potentially some of the cases that might have been published. And they're enthusiastic uh, because when you're employed, um, a lot of the time you're going to be working very closely um, with other members of staff. Uh, and we're often sitting there thinking not only can this person do the job, but is this somebody that I would like to spend the best part of my day with? And so I think a, a great attitude, um, somebody who's interesting, uh, somebody who takes work seriously, uh, but I think also understands that there have to be some work-life balance. So don't just think it's all about law. There's got to be a little bit more, certainly the people that come to us. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how do you see the future for aspiring barristers following the current slowdown and an already saturated field? Uh, Social, would you like to uh, jump in on this? Um, I, I can only really speak from a criminal perspective, um, but I, and I've only um, 
been in practice for 10 years now, I've never seen things so bad in terms of um, the way in which people are being thin from the field and the respect with which the criminal bar is being treated by the government. And more generally, there's a, an undermining of the rule of law, as we've all seen in recent times, which gives a good indication of whether things are likely to get better or worse, um, certainly with this government and potentially with future ones. Um, I, I would say the hardest things now are, there have been a number of chambers, uh, as you may have heard, which have withdrawn their criminal pupillages. And there is a limitation on the number of pupils that can be taken on because of financial constraints, and there will be for years to come. And more than that, um, people who are junior tenants, um, who are pupils um, at a number of chambers, not fortunately at all chambers, um, the, the larger ones who are able to look after their um, charges well and their new tenants well and have an abundance of work will be fine. But people are struggling to, to make ends meet. And the difficulty that they also face is the way in which the payment structure um, of uh, Chambers has worked. Essentially, it's um, paid in arrears. It's based on receipts um, after build work. And often build work only can be built once cases have come to a conclusion. There is a dearth of trials um, taking place at the moment, and it's not anticipated with the second lockdown that things will get any better. So I'm very sorry to have to paint such a bleak picture. Um, having said that, if you are genuinely passionate about it, and most importantly, as, as I was told 10 years ago, um, when things were bad, um, but not as dire as now, if you want to make a success of this, and if you want to make a career of this, um, as long as you go into it with open eyes, um, then that's all that can be asked. And there are plenty of opportunities still out there, which mean not just focusing on one particular area or one particular niche, but having a, a multitude of, um, uh, I would suppose, uh, the modern term as I've had it recently is side hustles, essentially um, quasi criminal work, um, professional disciplinary work, um, and also um, quasi-legal work, um, inquiries, etc., that you can undertake. So it's not the end of the road, but things are getting very, very difficult indeed. And so you need to be um, sure that you're taking the right path, particularly in the criminal sphere, and you need to be passionate about it more than anything else. And one way to do that is to um, try and get as much experience remotely or in person as you can to work out whether this is actually something you want to do. So don't go into it lightly is my advice. Thank you, Social. And as somebody who's just been through the process, Alice, do you have anything to add to that question at all? I think uh, the key point which uh, Social has mentioned is I think you have to go in with a broad, uh, broad interest. I don't think now is a time where you can say, I'm only going to do this small area of law. Anisha is great, but not when you're trying to enter. It is unfortunately really, really competitive right now. Um, and I think you have to go in expecting you may not get your pupillage or, you know, anything like that. You might not get it the first time round. I think most of my friends have gotten it on their second, third attempts. I was a second attempt. So you have to have a certain level of um, appreciation that it, it is competitive. But I think if you are genuinely interested in the work and then you will just keep fighting, you've got to sort of hold on to the fact that um, it's competitive. But I think most of us will say it's always been worth it. I don't have any regrets for having to deal with the very competitive nature of getting in. And so if you can keep, you know, keep your options open, try and keep them wide and find the smallest bits to be interested in, in, in everything, then hopefully you should still be able to uh, get in and have a great career at the end of it. Thank you, Alice. Uh, some good tips there. So it seems that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I think what we'll do now is we'll jump on to uh, some questions that we um, have had on the night. So if anyone thinks of any questions, feel free to put your hand up and uh, we can turn to you to ask the question or pop in the chat if you find it easier. So I'm just looking through the chat now at some of the questions that we've had. Uh, so the first question is, 
would you recommend qualifying into the criminal bar privately? And what would you recommend for a student to undertake to enhance the chance of gaining scholarships and pupillage? Okay, so we've had a similar question earlier, but um, a slightly different slant on this. Uh, so, so does anyone have any uh, suggested answers for this question? So anything that you can do to uh, enhance your chances of gaining a scholarship or pupillage? Uh, John? <clears throat> I think it's already been said, but I'd like to amplify it. Um, when you are, as an employer, looking through applications, you will see that everybody has got a law degree, everybody has done marshalling, everybody's done mini pupillage. What you really need to be doing is looking for something that makes you stand out from the crowd. So I said on a previous panel, uh, and I think Carl's made the point today that, you know, as an employer, you want somebody who's going to be competent, but you also want somebody who's going to be interesting. And I remember reading an application from a, a, a lawyer who um, had said that in his spare time, he did skydiving. And I was, I was completely fascinated by this because I thought anybody who's got A, the courage, uh, and, and B, the aptitude to do a sport like that had to be somebody who had something about them. And that person was interviewed and they got the job, not just because they were a great skydiver, but because they were also a very good lawyer. But it was because they did something different that made them stand out from the crowd that actually um, enhanced them in the eyes of the, um, of the employer. <clears throat> the other thing I'd like to add is uh, if you are in uh, an interview, and I think um, Sushil may have made this point about um, uh, maybe and Sushil made a point about preparation, but um, or was it Carl? But it doesn't matter. At the end of an interview, quite often the interview panel will ask you, "Do you have any questions of the panel?" Now, for me, to use footballing terms, that's an open goal, because if you've researched the employer. So say it's the Crown Prosecution Service. And let's say, for example, you've seen in the media that they've been struggling to get convictions in female genital mutilation cases. You can say at the end, I've noticed that the Crown Prosecution Service is struggling to get convictions in FTM cases, female genital mutilation cases. What are the particular challenges and how do you see the way forward to improve the prospects of success? Now, what that tells the employer is that you have researched <clears throat> um, <clears throat> what they do and you've effectively utilised the question that they asked you at the end to demonstrate that. So the, the, the problem with advocacy is you can prepare all day long and it's Murphy's law that the judge never asks you the question that you spent hours preparing. So I'm sorry that took a little bit of a long um, winded way of explaining that, but I hope that's of some assistance to you. Thank you, John. That was a great answer to the question. Uh, next question is specifically for Alice, and it is, what type of work did you encounter during second six as a clinic and PI pupil, uh, personal injury? And how would you recommend preparing for a clinical negligence and personal injury pupillage? So I've gone through pupillage during COVID, and I can tell you the experience I had was nothing like what the previous pupils before me had. Um, to a degree, it's been very sort of, I think, chamber specific. Um, I'll say I only had one case um, so far, and I've got my second one upcoming on Monday, um, which is not entirely normal. I think from my friends also in this sort of area in other chambers, usually you'd have a couple of cases a week and it's mostly sort of road traffic accidents um, there'll be sort of short uh short trials um half day sort of thereabouts um so there's it, it's it's mostly going to be that sort of low level stuff um for me my one that i have done was actually immigration law and the one i've got upcoming on monday is about uh to telephone hearing 
about um, whether or not a trial should be vacated, half hour hearing and a trial later in October. Um, not sure if that's exactly uh, helpful to hear, but there we go. Um, in terms of preparing for a pupillage though, um, the advice I was given just before I started was take a break, get some rest, uh, get your energy together because it's going to be a tough year. And that was literally the advice of everyone within Chambers. That's not just one person who was being quite kind. That was the advice from everyone. And I'm sure that applies to other pupillages as well. Um, but if you do want to do something because you feel uncomfortable just taking a break, fair enough. Um, I would say you would want to probably revise your basic negligence principles, just to understand duty of care and um, those sort of basic elements. Um, you don't need to know a sort of undergrad level extreme amounts of case law, just roughly how negligence cases work. Um, I'd say there's also One Crown Officer does a great podcast, uh, Law Pod, that tends to cover a lot of really interesting uh, cases that are quite relevant. And also, I'd say, keep an eye out for key cases in the area. So a lot of cases have come out this year for the sort of negligence field. So if you have sort of your eye on those things, then you're probably ready for a pupillage in for Meg and PI. Thank you, Alice. Very detailed answer there about the PI and Clinic pupillage. <laughs> Sounds like you've made the, made the most of it anyway. I have done my very best in the circumstances, but no regrets, that's for sure. That's ideal. <laughs> right, okay, the next question that we have is, how do you recommend gaining a mini pupillage? I'm a second year student trying to gain my first mini, and during the current climate, it seems near impossible. Thanks. Uh, this might be one to go back to Alice as the person who's been through this most recently. Um. So... I think the best you can do is just keep applying to chambers um, just as you normally would. I think quite a few chambers are changing what they're doing. So there's some that aren't doing necessarily mini pupillages, but they're doing um, sort of talks and um, networking with small groups of students. So I had a friend who was supposed to be doing a mini pupillage um, and that got cancelled. And instead they had this sort of networking session and they did a few sort of tasks and stuff. Um, over Zoom type things. So I guess just keep an eye out for Chambers that is offering something, some alternative, but I think the reality is just keep applying and sending out letters to wherever you can, because in the current climate, we don't know what will happen, but I think a lot of Chambers are still keen to, you know, advertise themselves to potential future pupils. So keep bashing out those uh, applications. So sorry, it's COVID. <laughs> Yeah, I think I would agree with that. And one point I would make is be cheeky. You know, don't be afraid. So don't sit there and wait for mini pupillages to be advertised. So what I used to do as a student is if there was a particular area of law I was interested in, I would look for chambers or law firms who specialise in that area. I would put together a very detailed and personalised covering letter. So don't just put together a generic covering letter, but do one that's specific to that firm. Show that you've done a little bit of research, you're interested in them bang it out with a CV and say, I'm interested in this area of law. I like your firm. I like your chambers. Can I come in and do a few days worth of experience? And you'd be surprised how often that works. And um, also try and attend networking events as well, because I used to do that quite frequently as a student. You'll be able to speak to practitioners, barristers, solicitors, um, and ask them, you know, do you ever offer any experience? Get an email address for them, send a, a, you know, a CV across, a covering letter, and that quite often can work. And then finally, another way is to attend court as well. So as Social mentioned, go to court. You get to watch the advocacy, so you'll learn how advocates sort of uh, perform in everyday situations. But also, every now and again, you'll see barristers milling about. If they don't look too busy, go over, introduce yourself, talk to them, and you never know where it'll go. So my key message is, be cheeky, and you never know where it'll lead you. Right, let's see if we have any more uh, questions. Right, the next one, uh, for someone who does not have their first degree in law, is it better to do the PGDL or the LLM? Don't know if we have anyone on the panel that has any experience of that, but will be able to help us at all. No, <laughs> unfortunately not. <laughs> so, sorry, we can't, we can't help you with that one. It's quite a specific question. Uh, I think I'm suspecting most of our panelists have gone down the law degree route. And can I, can I make a suggestion, John? 
Yes. And I um, no longer sit on our pupillage committee. Um, I, I gave up my spot about six months ago because um, I had a range of other work on. But as far as we're concerned in terms of recruitment and also um, in relation to scholarship uh, interviews, people aren't really bothered as to what you've done for your undergraduate degree. Um, I would actually suggest some, um, someone who's done a law degree as undergrad and postgrad, etc. Um, I enjoyed it, but I think I would have had more fun doing history or German as an undergrad degree. And some parts of me wish I had done that. And so I think you shouldn't limit yourself by thinking, oh, well, I want to pursue a career as a lawyer. That means I must do law. If you do a degree that you're interested in, you'll do well in it. And that's what people are looking at. It does, however, mean that there's extra time and expense incurred. So that's obviously important um, to realise. Um, but it doesn't matter that you've done that. And insofar as doing the PGDL or LLM, I think that was the, the original question or one of the other questions that's popped up. I'm not entirely sure what um, the distinction um, you're seeking to, to make is, but everyone's got to do a... Um, CPE, what used to be known as that after you do a non a GDL after you do a non-law degree um, and then afterwards um, you either do your um, bar course or, or new uh, LPC so um, general advice is do whatever you want to do for undergrad do well in it um, but bear in mind that it will cost extra. Thank you social some good practical tips there well, so hopefully that's uh, that's been very helpful and has answered the question um, just going back to a previous point as well, I can see Aria has made a point that King's Chambers have a virtual mini pupillage coming up in October. Um, do you have any details about that, Aria? Uh, yeah, so I, I think all the details are on the website, but I know the first day, um, which takes the form of seminars on the different practice areas, is open to everyone. It's limited by numbers, but you, you just basically express an interest and, and you'll get on it. And then the second day is sort of more detailed application and you can you can apply for either or both oh fantastic well some information there so hopefully that's been helpful uh final question that we have here uh what would you recommend doing if re rejected for pupillage Do you have anyone with any suggestions Alice? um having recently dealt with that as well um i will say you kind of, firstly get feedback if you can from your chambers i think um some of them will say we don't give feedback we're, we're too busy but do your best to get some sort of feedback because that'll show you the gaps that you really ought to be filling um in terms of what to do with your year to improve yourself before the next round of applications um have a look through your cv have a look through what um possible things could you do like what what areas have you not covered perhaps maybe it's the uh, legal area of law or maybe a particular skill so anything any gap like that identify it and do your best to tackle it um in terms of things to do in the sort of year while you're waiting around or before the next application there's quite a few jobs out there which are aimed specifically at um those who've recently graduated and they're quite a convenient sort of 10 to 12 month period so, for instance, I was a judicial assistant at the Court of Appeals. So that was a 10 month period. Um, there's the Law Commission. Um, there's quite a few charities as well that do sort of quite lengthy internships. So that both can help keep you financially sustained until the next round of applications. And that can also be quite handy for building up your experience. Um, and in terms of uh, sort of advocacy specific ones, um, so there's, for instance, um, free representation unit, um, LPC law, um, communities empowerment network. That's a school um, school exclusion one. So there's quite a lot of things that you can kind of dip into um, for the sort of period while you're waiting for the next round of applications. Um, but yeah, I think the main thing you need to do is work out what those gaps are and make sure that you're tackling it. Those specific uh, weaknesses. Um, after your rejections and uh, keep, your, keep your head high and uh, apply again next year. Okay. Can I also add to what Alice has said? Um, uh, over the years, I've, I've had a number of people um, who've been unable to get pupillage come and do um, paralegal work at firms that I have worked in. And the benefit of that, particularly if you're interested in crime, is that you're getting the experience of the litigation 
Um, there's also the option to potentially qualify as a police station advisor, but more importantly, you're getting in on the ground floor with the people that are instructing barristers. And, and as a rule, my firm, for example, use half a dozen different sets. And so the paralegals have access, direct access to barristers, to the clerks. And so if you are looking for something, all of Alice's suggestions are excellent, um, but don't discount um, stepping away from the bar route for a period of time and getting direct experience with a firm of solicitors. Um, if you get taken on in chambers that they instruct, they're more likely to instruct you as well once you're, uh, once you're a tenant because they understand your work and your work ethic. Excellent. Great tips there. And I think the other thing as well is that when you go in as a paralegal, quite often you'll do some of the tasks that barristers will do anyway. So particularly personal injury seems to be an area where a lot of people do paralegal work. And quite often you might be drafting um, uh, particulars of claim or schedules of loss, which barristers would do. So you're doing on a smaller scale, the same job there. So you've got practical experience to put onto your CV and on application forms as well. So it's a good way of building up the skills that you'll use uh, in later life. John, could I, could I just jump in there and, and to build on that? I think you've got to widen, widen your horizons as well because there are a myriad of bodies that you could get some sort of work experience with, either as a formal employee for a temporary period or uh, as a short work experience. So you know, the RSPCA, they've got a legal department. Most police forces have got a legal department. The health and safety executive have got a legal department. Local authorities have got legal departments. Most bodies will have a legal department. So if you can get your foot in the door um, somewhere, then you can build upon that and get the skills which you can then use as a foundation to enhance your pupillage application moving forward. And who knows, you may join them temporarily and end up carving out a career that you didn't expect to actually go into. It's a very good point. You, you never know where you're going to go with this profession. Excellent. Well, I think that brings us quite nicely to the end of the Q&A session. I'd like to thank everybody for the questions that they've submitted uh, and thank our panellists for the great advice that they've provided tonight. Uh, I've brought our three judges back into the room now. Um, so what I will do at this point is I'll take the chance to hand over uh, for judgment and some feedback for our mooters. Uh, so when you're ready, judges, if you would like to take it away. Okay, well, I, it's, it's fallen to me to give the judgment of the court. Uh, since 1931, this is an issue that has come before the courts time and time again. At last, it can be resolved by the highest court in the land. Most of the authorities before us cite as their starting point the case of Harrison and Hill of 1932, originating from the Scottish High Court of Judiciary. In fact, it's a Scottish case. We don't hold it against them. It was in this case where Lord Clyde, the Lord Justice General, made it plain that there is a distinction between the public generally as opposed to special classes of members of the public. This has been a theme which has repeated throughout the judgments that followed. He said further in the case that there must be, as a matter of fact, walking or driving by the public on the road or public place, and such walking or driving must be lawfully performed. In the Court of Appeal case, cited in one of the authorities, the case of Crown against Waters, it was the Court of Appeal that said, if only a restricted class of person is permitted or invited to have access, the case will fall on the side of the place being private. If only a restricted class is excluded, the place would be public. The case of Pew and Knight has been cited, and it was said that in order to turn what was prima facie private land into public place, it was necessary to establish that the public had access to the place. And as Lord Justice Widgery said in that case, the best way of showing that the public have access to that place is to show that they actually go there. Now on the agreed facts, it is clear that hitherto there has been no public encroachment on what obviously is private land. It was first thought that the prosecution's case would be that the guests going on this occasion made the land public. Well, Mr. Allen has gone off his skeleton argument that was provided to the court and instead argued 
that in the first place that the members of the club were still public. Well, that is a submission that this court does not agree with. He then conceded that if he lost that argument, that he was only left with a policy argument, which I'll come to in a moment. The crux really in this case is whether the guests are members of the public or whether they have unique characteristics that they are not members of the public. Have they inherited the characteristics of the people they are with? And it's clear from the cases that have been cited, particularly the case of Cohen uh, is of assistance here, that they are uh, the 50 guests were certainly not members of the ordinary public. And uh, Mr. Allen's policy argument was uh, threadbare uh, at best, nonsensical at worst, and quite frankly, we didn't agree with him. And so for those reasons, the uh, appeal by the Crown is dismissed and the uh, defendant, the respondent, is allowed to continue getting drunk and drive his merry way. That's the judgment of the court and I think uh, we're now going to give some feedback. Yes, if you could, that would be fantastic. Uh, okay, gentlemen, uh, uh, just because Mr. Allen, you lost on the law, uh, overall we came to the conclusion uh, that in terms of your mooting, uh, you were uh, the winner. Uh, our feedback, uh, and we've, we've had quite a discussion about this, and uh, I'll do a little bit, and I'm sure uh, Jared will do some, and then Darren will do some, or, or whichever way around uh, we go. Uh, um, one thing I say say to you, Robert, is the second second time I've seen you move now because I actually judged you in the final on the last occasion. But uh, be a little bit more careful about drawing analogies. Uh, when I say drawing analogies, is uh, you may one day find yourself in front of a left-leaning judge, who, if you tell him that generally it, it's it's there are vast amounts of high-powered German motor cars around that all people are now driving, you may find that he's or she is less inclined to favour you on that particular point and ask you to go and find, go and throw yourself in the pits of Oldham for a couple of weeks and see what the real world is like. So be a little bit more. If if, if I may, if it's any consolation, um, I actually drive a rather run-down uh, Vauxhall, so, <laughs> so it's not me. <laughs> but no, yeah, thank you. Just be careful, a little bit more careful about your analogies because you don't, you don't know your tribunal that well as to know whether or not they will, they will be good-humoured about it or, or not be good-humoured about it, as it were. Um, something that both of you did, uh, and it, 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 it's a consequence of mooting. Uh, that, that, that you focus entirely, you focus a great deal on etiquette and the way etiquette works and the way you think you should be talking to the court uh, and how you go about talking to the court. I'm afraid hacks like, certainly like me and, me and Gerard are, cert uh, are certainly of the, the school of thought that you get in, you get on with it and you get done. Um, yes, I appreciate that there is a marking scheme and we're, 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 you're expected to say certain things and use certain phrases, but there comes a point where they become a bit repetitive. And actually they're detracting away from what you're actually trying to tell us, which is why we should accept your position on the law as opposed to why we should be accept why we, and why we should reject that. And if, I, if I'm getting lost in uh, may I please say this and may I move on to that and however many times you can say, you, you know, how, how much more can you, can I assist you? and there are more platitudes in there than there is legal argument, then you're not really making legal argument. And remember, you're time limited in there. So you'll be forgiven uh, for just getting on with it. In actual fact, you may find that your tribunal is a little bit more uh, receptive to that as a, as a form of advocacy than, than they are of a very, I'd say, antiquated uh, language in terms of how you address the court. Uh, certainly that was more uh, something that area that we found in respect of your advocacy was something a little bit more prevalent. Um, Robert, overall, you were, you were both, in fairness, you were both very polished and you were both very impressive in terms of, of Newton's and, and your advocacy style was, was warm and quite, uh, quite welcoming. It's just that, Robert, you picked Aria a little bit in terms of 
and it may be, it may be our fault because you got you got a little bit of a settling in period by telling us what the facts of the case were. So you, you then picked up more of a stride. But unfortunately, as the respondent, you're straight into it, looking at our ugly faces, going, "Oh my God, um, what am I supposed to do with this now?" Um, something that was drawn out in the judgment, of course, Robert, is you, you did you didn't deal with one particular point, which would have probably nipped you over the the line in terms of the the legal argument which was well yes i may not get very far on the issue of um the club members and their membership but actually the guest i'm, I'm sure as hell going to get you on that um, and for that one night only we probably would have found and made an inference that they were members of the public that were using it as public and it was a public place because there's nothing to say that we can't give it give a degree of fluidity about it and say that a private piece of land can become public dependent on the people that are using the piece of land at the time they're using it. Um, so, yes, it had you, and that then takes you back to what we were talking, you were talking about in Pew and Night, actually, is, and that was drawn out in terms of one of the questions that was asked was, actually, if we'd have been invited, been invited to make certain inferences, you may well have found us on a different, on a different footing altogether in terms of our decision on the law, but there we go. Uh, there was nothing in terms of nervous twitches or ticks that we could that we could identify. A couple of erms dropped in here and there, but you, you know, there's nothing wrong with that and we'd be forgiven for doing that. Um, all I'd say is, uh, as well, in terms of make sure signposting was quite clear that you both were, were well equipped in terms of the brief and the brief that you were dealing with. Um, whether it's because John's used this moot problem about 4,000 times now, I'm not quite sure, but um, and you were both very very good with the the authorities. And in fact, Ari, I'd say that you, that you drew us more towards specific parts of authorities than, than perhaps Robert, you did, but as, which was a more broad brush approach in, in terms of your submission. Uh, so, but yeah, if there's a skeleton argument, Robert, and if you are going to go off the skeleton argument, Tell us you're going off to skeleton now. Otherwise, we're looking at your written arguments going, well, this has nothing to do with what he's put before us here. There we go. So that, that's my, for what it's worth, what I, what I thought and, and what we potentially collectively thought. But I'll, I'll move, let somebody else do the talking now because I've talked too much. I can be just a little bit picky um, for both of you, if I may. Um, Aria, uh, in particular, th there were a couple of things that you said. We didn't like you saying, uh, we say, and um, they say, uh, you know, the, the respondent's contention would have been a better way of dealing with that. It's a, it's a small point, but, it, but reducing it into we and they just didn't really have that sort of court etiquette about it, if you like. Um, we thought as well that you, you were rather in danger, Aria, with one comment when you said, uh, we say the court is obliged to find the cases the same here. Well, of course, we're not. Um, so just be very careful about sort of sweeping statements like that. Um, but both of you, in terms of your organisation of it overall, uh, good. The, uh, there was a, a lack, as Callum has said, there was a lack of um, irritating uh, ticks or too many errs or nervous habits or anything like that. So you were both quite compelling storytellers when it came to that. Um, the, um, yeah, I think the, uh, coming to uh, Robert, what we did like as well was, although in a way you maybe didn't make the most of it, what was quite a model thing you did when you first started speaking to us was to say that you were going to set out a question. Uh, and that was, that was quite a nice way to approach it. We, we liked that. Um, albeit we weren't entirely convinced that you set out the right question or set it out in the right way. But nevertheless, it's a useful way and it goes back to what Callum said about signposting. So, that was a that was a good um, a good technique, uh, and um, I think that's um, that's pretty much my nitpicking um, done with two very good performances. But I um, just felt on on balance that um, perhaps the more confident storytelling, if you like, um, lay with Robert. I have nothing else to add because I know the time is running on. So well done, both of you. I just want to say thank you to the judges and obviously congratulations to Robert. Thank you very much. I'd like to, to thank both of you for competing tonight and all of our judges for the feedback. Uh, well done. Congratulations, Robert. First ever champion of champions. Uh, champion. And uh, well done to you as well, Aria. You did well tonight. I certainly didn't envy the judges 
It uh, would have been a really tough uh, mood to call there. I certainly couldn't have called it. Uh, and as uh, Callum says, that uh, that problem has been used uh, before. Who would have thought we'd have a number of barristers talking on YouTube about drifting in Japanese cars? But there we are. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much to everybody that's come tonight. Uh, really appreciate the effort. Um, we will have a number of um, subsequent events coming up. So during the month of October, there are going to be four more Q&A sessions. Uh, each is going to be focused on a specific area of law. So sign up for that will be launched uh, next week. So if you keep an eye on our social media, it's always at Speed Mooting or the website. You'll be able to find details for those events. Uh, I have had a number of inquiries recently about mooting. I'm looking to have um, some sort of virtual competitions arranged shortly. And um, so hopefully if you've watched tonight and you thought I quite fancy a go of that, um, I'll be opening up the opportunity for more people to have a go at mooting soon. Um, so that brings us to the end of the evening. Once again, thank you to everybody for taking part. Uh, tonight's event has been sponsored by publicspeakingtuition.com.